Boardroom Bound, episode 150, Building a Board Portfolio as a Subject Matter Expert with David Shedd. Always try to do the right thing, set out a standard that you do that right thing when no one is watching, and that you lead people by the way that you practice servant leadership, and you act in such a way that ethically you stand head and shoulders above what the easy thing would be to do rather than the right thing to do. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Boardroom Bound. My name is Alexander Lowry, and this is the podcast dedicated to intentional leadership in the boardroom. My goal is to give aspiring and existing directors the tips, tactics, and strategies necessary to transform your confidence and build a successful career as a board director. Quick reminder, you can get all of today's show notes at podcast.gordon.edu. In today's episode, we're speaking with David Shedd, and David is a seasoned government expert from the intelligence industry, 30-plus years working for the CIA, uh, acting director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. He has served with some of the most high-profile government people, including being the personal intelligence advisor to President George W. Bush. He has a lot of information about how to take an expertise, which is something we all bring, and use that to translate over into his board career. He now serves on multiple boards in multiple industries, brings a tremendous expertise at taking massive amounts of information, distilling it down into short snippets. And of course, this is a wonderful person to be promoting as we think about Veterans Day tomorrow. And this is someone who we generally think of as not the uniform type, right? The, the person who has four stars on their shoulders, the military leader, but the people serving in government in different capacities are all also people we should be celebrating on Veterans Day. I can't wait to share David's stories with you. Before we jump into today's show, I'd like to share a message from our sponsor about director certification. Want to join your first board or are you looking for additional board seat opportunities? In either scenario, be sure to be disciplined in your approach. Now through the Becoming an Exceptional Board Director Candidate Coaching and Certification course, you get both modern board director candidate packaging, and modern board operations knowledge integrated within one program. Remember, the key to landing additional or your first board seat is in your packaging. Make the effort to do it right. Program graduates also receive their globally recognized international board director competency designation upon course completion. It's designed for individuals and groups. You can learn more at bit.ly slash IBDC dash D. That's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash I-B-C D-C dash D. And now let's jump into the show. David Shedd, welcome to the Boardroom Bound podcast. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Well, David, the, the pleasure is all mine, and, and it is an honor to have someone of your pedigree and service to the government uh, joining us today. And there are so many insider secrets you won't be able to tell us. We won't ask you about those today, but it's going to be an amazing story for our audience to think about people's different background experience and how those translate so well into the boardroom and your sort of upper echelon experience leading some of the intelligence community. We can all imagine clearly what having someone like that on a board could be so helpful to understand uh, how things play out in real time versus what we might have heard over time, digesting large pieces of information to pull out the best stuff, uh, the networks you will have brought. There's so much more we're going to unpack today as well. I'm really excited to jump into this. But before I start going into those stories, please give us a sense of how your career built over time and when you retired the government, that sort of senior role that you were in. So over the course of 33 years in government, in service to our country, which was always my goal, I was inspired to join the government and in the specific area of the Central Intelligence Agency because as uh, my wife-to-be, as we were dating, watched the Iranian hostage taking and then the holding of those hostages in in 1979-1980 and were inspired to try and do something about uh, the standing of the United States or around the globe, recognizing in time that intelligence was a vital part to giving a decision maker an advantage over what the adversary uh, doesn't know that we know about them. The other instigator was that as a son of missionaries, I lived under uh, communism, Marxism in Chile in 1970, 71, and 72 with Salvador Allende as, as the elected president, and I was very curious as to what this relation was, or the relationship between Allende 
in Fidel Castro on the island of Cuba. And even though I was just a very young boy, that really inspired me to try and do something related to international affairs and national security. And the Lord opened up this this opportunity to do so through the intelligence community, and specifically, at least at the start of my career, with CIA. And that, of course, grew over time into more prominent roles and opportunities, including including when you uh, retired from the government in 2015, you were leading the Defense Intelligence Agency. And uh, I guess that enterprise, when I think about it, so clearly civilians, but also military people on the order of you know 16,000. That's a very large company, if we want to put it in that context. Indeed. And, and as the deputy director at the end of my career, being there for four years in that capacity, I was de facto the chief operating officer for an agency, as you describe it, of about 16,000 individuals, 80%, 85% of whom were either still in uniform serving our country or former military uh, officers who had served and uh, non-commissioned officers that uh, had joined DIA. And, and that was a real opportunity, again, to serve our country, doing really two enormous uh, episodes following 9-11-2001 that being in Afghanistan and Iraq, and in which DIA played a, a critical role. And then I had the opportunity to be the acting director for about six months while the uh, three-star uh, general in this particular case was then confirmed to come to DIA. And so the arc of my career started as a collector at CIA in 1982. It went on to leadership positions and then the opportunity to serve in the George W. Bush White House in 2001 to 2005, then with intelligence reform coming out of the the disasters of 9-11 and then subsequently the failure of, uh, that we had in intelligence related to Iraq in March of 2003 and going into Iraq and not finding the proverbial weapons of mm. mass destruction under Saddam Hussein. I then joined uh, the, the newly created Office of the Director of National Intelligence for about five years before going to DIA, and that's really the arc of the career. So it really blended both intelligence collection and appreciation and assessment of that intelligence in, in my career, and then the policy side as it related to serving in the White House for, for nearly five years. And it, it's interesting if we try to begin to extract some of the lessons for people here, because wherever they start in their career, whether it's in the private sector, the public sector, et cetera, you will have experiences you build on, you build a reputation that hopefully precedes you. And that is part of what is going to happen in order to land a board seat. So when I imagine yourself, uh, you know, we could imagine people seeing, okay, this is the person who briefed the president. You were, you were the, his intelligence advisor, for President Bush. Uh, you were also the person leading the organization. Perhaps this is the kind of person people are imagining, okay, um, in front of Congress in terms of a panel and having to present. And clearly you were working with some very uh, intelligent, well-respected, well-networked people as individuals probably great for your career when you look back on it now. And when you, so at this point, you've now moved from the government role and you serve on multiple boards. I think it's about eight at the moment. And when you look back on that experience and you think, okay, if I were doing it intentionally then to say, I want to go to boards later, you might've doubled down on some of the activities that you were doing, whether it's the networking, whatever it might be. Help us look back on that now, because we can all do that in our own experiences. We begin to project forward to think, I want to be on board someday. What were some of the most useful things as you were going about doing your job, doing it really well, which have been helpful to you as you've gone forward into the board portion of your career? Well, Alexandra, as, as I think back on this profound question that you ask, I would certainly put at the top of that list that engagement with uh, senior policymakers, the president himself being at the pinnacle of that as the as the the, the CEO and chairman of the of the largest corporation in the world, uh, if you will, uh, from that position, and recognizing that you had to distill information down to uh, what he uh, had to know. Uh, in order to at least have options for making the decision, if not the decision itself. And the other very useful aspect was it was being very candid and ethically very uh, clear on what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And and this was tested repeatedly in those kind, kind of engagements. 
The other thing that prepared me very well was in large organizations, which would have similarities to a large corporate structure, the single biggest issue that you deal with are, are personnel issues. I won't always call them problems. They, they can be by design, the sorts of things that are structural in terms of, of designing or redesigning a uh, human resources system inside those organizations so that you're more efficient, more uh, transparent, and that sort of thing that certainly has an application to the corporate world. And the, the third element is that it was an effort, certainly, to always try to do the right thing, set out a standard that you do that right thing when no one is watching, and that you lead people by having a, a view of the organization and the people that make up that organization in a way that you, you practice servant leadership. And you act in such a way that ethically you stand uh, head and shoulders above what the easy thing would be to do rather than the right thing to do. Fascinating. Uh, just one small nugget. I remember Colin Powell's analyst uh, telling uh, in a newspaper article one day that he was told by that when Colin Powell became chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he said, here's how I want you to brief me. You tell me what you know, then you tell me what you don't know, and only then do you tell me what you think. And that fax was a very interesting situation, that layout. And I imagine in some ways that is very different from the types of communications that happen in the boardroom, right? You have a lot of very intelligent people with great backgrounds and experiences coming together, sharing what they know. And just like you've described the sort of intelligence gathering and sharing, like you've got to get a lot across in a very short period of time, how you communicate is so important. Have you felt that there have been some sort of translation processes or adjustments you've gone to from, say, some of the government work to being a lot more in the private sector uh, where you're working with people that perhaps come with a different mentality and background? I would, uh, I would say that the biggest challenge for me was to go from being the operational person, that would be the equivalent of the CEO or the chief operating officer in that corporate structure that I now am serving on in terms of the fiduciary responsibilities of a board, and then really serving in the role of governance. So whether I am a chairman of a board, which I am, or whether I'm a board member, the, the challenge is, is to not get in there and do that CEO or president and CEO's job. And that, that was a transition because you uh, oftentimes want to be quite directive, but rather you place the responsibility on that president uh, and CEO in such a way that you hold him or her responsible for uh, executing on that, let's say, the strategy for that corporation, rather than executing on that strategy. And and that was a significant uh, change for me from someone that was running a large uh, agency, such as the Defense Intelligence Agency, or even in the White House, where you were really carrying out the president's agenda in, in promoting the execution of those policy objectives that, that were set out by the president, again, against a strategy uh, as a national security strategy in that case, or the defense strategy in the case of the Department of Defense, as that came through the White House. And so it was far more of a directive role there than I have found it to be in the corporate world, in the role that I now play. Right. And David, when we talked about your career trajectory before, we talked about how it was in 2015 when you retired from being in the government, working for the agency. And now I imagine you've probably watched in the last you know, 18 months, two years, and I'd be curious about your thoughts on whether there's a shift in the corporations, let's say in the boardroom, of the respect that people probably have even more so for someone like your background coming out going, wow, look at how the world has changed in terms of, look at the interrelationships of supply chains. Because it's not just one supply chain. There's supply chains within supply chains within supply chains. Uh, our people matter more than ever before, at least our awareness of doing that, the geopolitical tensions we're seeing with China and other places, and how all of this makes everything so much more complicated because it layers on top of itself. We need someone who understands how this stuff interplays and can look through all this information, help us synthesize it so that we can make the right decisions for our business. And I look at someone like your background experience go, my gosh, we've got to have someone like 
like David with us to help us figure all this stuff out. Are you seeing that there's more of an appetite for people looking from, say, the private sector, looking at people that are leaving, whether it's, say, a four-star general, whatever it might be, thinking we need that background and experience? Uh, I do, and I'll give you four observations on precisely that both question and commentary that you just made, Alexander. The first is that the interconnectivity of the world drives uh, boardroom conversations around issues that are geopolitical in nature or certainly well beyond the economic boundaries of, of the nation that one resides in, in this case, the United States, uh, for this conversation to really take into account what other countries are, are doing and what is happening in the currency markets and at the uh, and manufacturing and all the other aspects of it in terms of the competition. That's observation number one. Observation number two is that the boardroom, uh, in terms of drawing from my experience, is also talking about threats and risk in a very different way. And probably at the top of that list is, of course, cyber risk. And again, coming from an intelligence background, it's something I would say I'm certainly quite familiar with them. I wouldn't say I am a profound subject matter expert, but certainly that was something that, that we were looking at very closely. The third area was technology, and that technology is a driver to change. And as, as we look at greater power competition coming from places like China or Russia as a disruptor and the allies that they uh, rely on as well, such as Iran and North Korea, I see that, that the disruption of, of those players when it comes to technology is, is a, a significant aspect of it. And the last, the last comment is that I see a much more active uh, role for the board in shaping the strategies for the, the companies or the corporations in which I'm engaged with in terms of seeing those first three issues, which is not an exhaustive list, but certainly a contributor to better understanding what we can do for that corporation in moving forward and, and giving that advice and counsel, so to speak, to the CEO and to the corporate officers of the C-suites that, that we're involved with. David, I like that list a lot. And let's start with the last point, because we've touched on it a little bit earlier in this episode about uh, when you went from being the equivalent of the CEO leading a large organization to being in the boardroom, that approach from learning from you know nose in to fingers out, the adjustment to that. And the way you're almost talking about it here is a related point. I think we're figuring about how do you enable the corporate leadership to reach their potential for themselves and for the organization, that balancing act, which is not just you, but also as a part of the board and doing that together. Clearly, that's a transition that I would think just about everybody would go through if they haven't yet. That'll be something you will learn to do because you succeeded in your career previously by being good and doing well. And that's not what your job is going to be being on the board. So I'd love to hear more about the observations that you've seen as you've gone through that for yourself or for others. The sort of the biggest takeaway that I take from the experience, which now is going on to seven years by, by this coming February of, of 2022 and the relationship to boardrooms is the critical, absolute critical importance of having a strategy. It's not that that strategy locks you into uh, a, a, a three-year, five-year uh, pathway to where there is no flexibility in adjusting to whether it's the P&L aspects of it and stuff happens in terms of changes, but that strategy serves as that foundational piece. And that's really what I took from the government sector in really designing then those capabilities around meeting the objectives of that strategy. And of course, you need a roadmap for implementation, and it really helps you with your resource allocation. And I think that's the role then of the, of the board member, or in one particular case, as chairman of the board, where I can drive that uh, execution measure of success or lack thereof in terms of where the corporation is going against a backdrop of a strategy. And, and that allows then both the corporate side, that is the company that, that's involved and the board 
to really come to, to a place of understanding of where there's a force multiplier by this vast experience that the board members bring to that corporation, starting with the president and CEO, in somewhat of an advisory capacity, but also with an oversight responsibility, which obviously we as independent board members are, are required to have. And, and David, related to that, I wonder if there's another point that takes me down the idea of, I'd, I'd love your thoughts on this, that you know, there's probably a, a right experience mix, maybe even number of board members to be a high-performing board. And I wonder what your experience has been around that. Well, some range from as few as three, and I would say that's generally too small because you have a disproportionate weight of responsibilities on particularly audit, finance, and budget, uh, and you kind of do it all, but for the size of the company involved, and it's one of these that has the Department of Defense oversight to it. Then I have one that has as many as 20, and it's a board of trustees, of a college, and that's, in my view, too many. And so I've kind of landed in the area of nine to 10 uh, board members. You want to create enough of a synergy among yourselves as, as a board uh, without going overboard, if I can use mm-hmm. the pun, uh, of having too many members and not too few in order to, to, to address the responsibilities. So I have a couple of boards that are right around that that demarcation. And I need to clarify, these are boards where you're non-advisory. These are the fiduciary boards. Advisory, it can, it can go up in numbers because you bring different things that the CEO and the C-suite are asking for advice on as opposed to that, that oversight responsibility that you have to include the performance of the CEO in the fiduciary uh, type of board that, I, that I'm talking about, where that ranges nine to 10 board members is sort of being ideal. And you've had such a prolific career, I would call it sort of your second act after you've left government, right? So uh, serving on multiple boards in multiple industries, wonderful background and mix and experience. And it would be really interesting for audience to hear how you transitioned from the senior government roles that you were in to, I would call it a portfolio board, you know, professional board member career now, how you went about that, especially in in terms of landing your first compensated board role. Uh, A couple of major factors in that was to find, uh, again, and you've mentioned it a couple of times, the kind of network that I was able to, to build up doing certainly the I would say the second to one third of the last portion of my career. And certainly when I was on the National Security Council staff, those are uh, a good number of dear friends of which one of them facilitated then my joining the board and really became beyond just the friend and, and good colleague that he had been on the NSC himself when we served together in the Bush administration, in, in the 43 Bush administration. Uh, as president, uh, the 43rd president, George W. Bush, was that uh, this particular individual really facilitated the mentoring and and really enabled that uh, advice and, and counsel. And I use that those words again to reflect how important it was to help me in that transition uh, into into the boardroom. The second factor was that I just uh, made it a almost a passion of mine to listen and to hear what others had to to uh, to share that had vastly more experience than I did at that point and certainly even still do in terms of the boardroom. That would be true of board members who have the strong experience in business, which obviously I did not have, or I'd be in jail today if I were making money inside the government for obvious reasons. And so running that P&L, the profit and loss, and, and uh, managing and leading through multiple uh, mergers and acquisitions, those were all the sorts of things where I just listened very attentively and then also um, made it a practice that there were no dumb questions in terms of really getting their perspective on those aspects of where I might be helpful. And uh, and today I 
serve as head of an audit committee, and I've and, and I've gone to school on my own learning in that sense of the word. Uh, six and a half years later. And I, I think that's a, a good nugget in there for all of us is that a board member, you're always growing and developing. And I think that's part of the fun of it, right? So you want to clearly bring some related background experience and expertise that they need, but there's also so much more if you learn whether you're in a new industry or a new organization or a new type of board committee, something like that. And I think that's so much fun. And every board member I know is always constantly reading. They usually have the sort of three different types of books on their nightstand, sort of maybe it's a biography about a leader that they're trying to learn from, from a space that they're in. Maybe it's a technical skill they're picking up to be more proficient in audit, whatever it might be. And it sounds like you're, you're enjoying that as well as you've gone about it. But David, there must have been a point where as you maybe you got your first board or two and you thought, this is great. I should be focusing on this space. What sort of flipped that switch for you? You thought I should be spending a lot of my time doing many board roles. Um, I thought uh, when I'm, I, I see myself as someone with uh, a fair amount of energy and I also am really taking great joy being in my sixties, uh, early sixties, but the sixties nonetheless. And, and seeing an opportunity to help others and to find a way to uh, continually give back. And so really it wasn't just the board experience, but it was really combined with other opportunities as an adjunct professor at Patrick Henry College. It's also as a visiting fellow at the Heritage Foundation. It's, it's missions trips and, and work with uh, a couple of NGOs as well. And so really it's, it's, it's akin to that uh, that kind of description of the whole person and that the boards are just one and albeit an important aspect of, of my government afterlife, but it's certainly not exclusively that. And my wife and I of 40 years have, have really focused on how do we continue to help others and find ways to uh, never stop learning, which is a reference to the previous question, and commentary in terms of learning uh, what to, what it takes to be uh, from good to maybe even bordering on great as a board member in terms of the contribution that one can make. And, and at the same time, really round out your life with those other things that you may be, in fact, very passionate about and making time for those things as well. Well, David, as I think about how to sort of tie this together with a bow, I'd, I'd love to give you a chance to pull out your crystal ball and look into the future of the boardroom. And I can think back to where we talked at the beginning of the show about your career and how it started in the 30 plus years in government. And there were some major transitional times, right? So you think about 9-11, as you referenced in Iraq and Afghanistan, and some major things that changed how we did business, if I want to call it that, in the government and certainly in the intelligence community. And we have watched the boardroom change so much over the last 18 to 24 months in terms of not only when they operate, how they operate, where they operate, what they discuss. And we can be positive that things will continue to change and grow and develop. And I'm wondering what you're seeing and thinking about as someone who's been a practice person in this space about reading the tea leaves in many ways. When you think about the future of the boardroom, what comes to mind for you? Probably three things as you were formulating your question, Alexander. The first thing is I think the board of the future is one where, as we answered or you asked the question and I answered the question along the lines of what characteristics of my own background will be important to a board. In other words, I don't see a diminution, but rather an, an extension, an expansion of having that geopolitical perspective that, that the board must have in, in really looking at, at the full breadth and depth of the board's um, role in terms of uh, leading an organization. Two, I think the area of ethics is really going to get pressed because I think looking into that crystal ball, I think we're in a, in a world today where relativism associated with how truth is handled is is really an enormous challenge. And I think having board members that are ethically sound and are very much prepared to call uh, balls and strikes as they see them is really, really absolutely critical. And the third element is that I think as board members, we also need to adapt to a world that is rapidly changing from you know, a very uh, sort of... Uh, pen and paper and maybe laptop combination of 
how you engage with the corporate structure that you're involved in to a much more readily uh, accessible uh, to them in terms of access to you and vice versa and your access to them in terms of the continuity associated with your relationship with the corporate structure and vice versa. So I'll give you one very quick example. One is training those officers of the corporation. Those are generally four or five members, the CEO, the CFO, the chief operating officer, uh, might be the chief HR in, in terms of those four or five, or the general counsel to, to that company. I think it's far more engagement with them in that capacity as a board in the future than just simply not because they're small jobs, but different jobs than what they do in their daytime work in terms of being the general counsel or being the chief operating officer, et cetera. Well, David, we were so grateful to have you on the show today and to translating your 30-plus years working for the government and the intelligence sector today. And thank you for sharing your insights and helping all of us to be boardroom-bound. Well, uh, it's been my pleasure. And just let me make a call out to Colin, Colin Powell and uh, the passing of a friend and someone that I spent a, uh, a fair amount of time in the government boardroom. That would have been the uh, the West Wing in the Situation Room at the White House, uh, looking through and, and figuring out on very heavy issues on behalf of President George W. Bush uh, back in those days. That's the capacity in which I knew him best, as opposed to the reference that you made earlier mm. uh, to, to him being chairman of the Joint Staff. But clearly, once he was Secretary of State, uh, that's that's where I engaged uh, most directly with him. And uh, he will be missed, and I am very sorry for that loss. I think that just speaks to the incredible network that you bring with you and the knowledge that you've learned from so many people. And I know the boards with which you are associated are blessed to have that insight as well, David. Well, thank you, Alexander. And it's been a, a privilege and an honor to, to do this, uh, this interview, and I hope that it is encouraging to others as well. That's it for this episode of Boardroom Bound. I really enjoyed chatting with David Shedd, especially as we think about tomorrow being Veterans Day. David was a CIA officer for nearly 33 years, including being active, acting director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. He served as President George Bush's intelligence advisor. And now, as after he retired, about seven years later, he's on eight boards. And he's a national security consultant, not surprisingly. And people tap into his knowledge to learn how do we take this and apply this for our companies. A great example of how we build a subject matter expertise and then translate that over into our board career. Now remember, if you head over to podcast.gordon.edu, you'll find links to all of today's resources. And please know that the Boardroom Bound team and I are so proud to be your go-to podcast for all things that connect, prepare, and empower you to land a board seat. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and miss any of the high-quality content that we're bringing to you every Wednesday. Thanks for joining me today. I can't wait to share more stories and strategies from brilliant business minds with you again next week. Remember to keep tuning in to be Boardroom Bound.